morning again. Morning. Now, earlier you talked about reviewing the Lori Fristyle and the Lowry time accounts and viewing that data set through Cellbrite. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. And you've previously recognized States Exhibit 29C and D, which are the Lowry time accounts. If you could look at your screen, Mr. Wood is loading it. It's taken just a minute. We need it. It's hooked up through the projector, the HDMI. Is your screen? So it'll be published on the. Yes, Judge. Very well. Okay. All right. Um, Agent Hart, what are we what are we looking at on the the projector? Um, it's displaying states twenty nine C and D, but what what view is it for the record? So this is the Cellbrite software. Essentially, what you're seeing here is the Lori for Style at iCloud dot com uh, iCloud account. Um, you can see Cellbrite up here. And then on the side where you see all of the different compartments, uh, different types of data that exists in the iCloud, with, with, with each of these types of data, cookies for instance, they, they will show the number of records that exist in the iCloud. So you have device locations, journeys, locations, emails, MMS messages, notes, and it goes on. SMS messages, I spent a substantial amount of time here. And you get an idea of the volume, uh, you know, over 13,000 text messages, um, voicemails, uh, images, so on and so forth. So this is what it looks like when you first, this is essentially the opening page of the Lori for style at iCloud.com and then Lolly Time would be a mirror of this. It's just simply a different account. Can we show them the Lolly Time page, please? Okay. And and that's pulling from the state's exhibit, correct? Yes. Okay. So this is the um, you can see it says Lolly Time at iCloud.com um, and it has the same compartments as the other iCloud, you'll see that the number of records in Lolly Time is substantially less than Lori for Style, and that's because Lolly Time uh, was created in April of 2019 and then goes through November of 2019. So this particular um, account um, is much smaller. Okay. So Lori for Styles was much longer because it wasn't used for a longer time. Lori for Style, the first, the earliest record in Lori for Style is December of 2000, so uh, close to 19 years. Okay. And then Lolly Time, I, I apologize, it started in what month? April of 2019. And it ceased to be used according Both. to what you could find? Correct. Both accounts ceased to be used in November of 2000, towards the end of November of 2019. Okay. Now, in... Um, Analyzing the records in states 29C and D, what process did you follow? A very methodical one. Um, I would go into each of these compartments, which also exist where it says device content. It'll say phone data, and then it will have all of these records, so Bluetooth devices, call logs, contacts, and and as you scroll down, you'll see all of the different compartments. And so my process was to open up one of those um, compartments and then examine the data that was in there. If there was something that was pertinent or relevant, then I would uh, make a document of that. In um, Lori Vallow's iCloud accounts, approximately how many records of data were there? 
I don't have an exact count, and that, that gets to be a little bit difficult. For instance, there's a section for chats. Well, one chat may contain 3,000 messages within that chat, but my best estimate from kind of tallying these is between 130 and 150,000 records. And um, if we could just turn to, just so the jury can see one of those, let's um, look at Lori for style, the SMS section, if we could. Can we please identify which exhibit we're looking at? Um, yes, absolutely. Is this the Lori for style, States Exhibit 29, I think it's D. Thank you. And turning to Lori for style um, in the SMS section, Let's look at line uh, 18842. So, Agent, while well, Mr. Wood helps locate that and display that, is that the process you had to go through for looking? process he's going through is that the process you had to go through to look at every one of these texts yes so in Lori for style I applied a date filter starting October 26th of 2018 when I applied that filter there were approximately 4,500 text messages and I started at that date and then read every single text message down to the to the last okay. and that's just the text messages yes and so I I followed that same process for all of the various compartments that you can see that are displayed uh, on this uh, screen so yes, I, I want to make a clarification here I think you may be looking at 29 C not D oh I'm sorry I apologize if I misspoke your honor okay thank you counsel yeah. Well, I think uh, we need to be clear if it is 29C or if it is 29D. If you could, yeah, let's confirm. This is Lori for style at iCloud.com. Okay. 29C. Okay. Is, is that what the court shows? Yes. Okay, good. And so turning to line 1842, uh, is that what's displayed up there, Agent? Yes. Um, could you show us um, sort of how you would figure out what that record was and what it revealed? Certainly. So you can see a timestamp. Um, so it would show the date that this message was sent on March 20th of 2019. Uh, under the parties, it would show the owner, that's Lori Vallow, and it was sent to her brother, Alex Cox. And then under the body, it contains the text message that was sent. In this case, it says, I'm finding out some great stuff about you. I'm going to do some ceilings. Can't wait to share all the things I learned about you. Wow, you're going to like it. It explains a lot. And so when you looked at those texts, were you also aware of what was happening around um, in that case um, to determine whether a text is relevant? Absolutely. As I, I was a participant in this case in its totality from essentially day two. And so having that knowledge as the investigation progressed, um, helped me to understand which text messages or other types of communications or records that might exist in the iClouds, uh, whether they were relevant or pertinent to the investigation. If they were, I would um, make a note of that, and um, that's how I proceeded as far as my analysis is concerned. So when you were determining whether a particular well, let me ask you, was every single text that Lori Vallow sent relevant to the investigation into what happened to J.J. Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and Tammy Daybell? Not at all. Okay. Why do you say that? Well, there were 
hundreds, thousands of texts between Lori Vallow and um, friends and associates, between uh, you know car rental companies, hotels, insurance. Um, there was a lot of communications uh, regarding um, appointments and medications for JJ and things that Tylee was doing. So there was there were the normal everyday type of communications that most individuals have and so those I examined those but they certainly really didn't have any bearing on the case. Okay. So how did you determine what was relevant? Based on the investigation, the totality of the investigation, what we had uncovered from witness interviews um, and from the various searches and other efforts that we were engaging in, we uh, had developed a pretty good idea of uh, what may have occurred and I was looking for communications that um, uh, were indicative of, uh, of participation uh, in the disappearance of J.J., Tylee, and uh, Tammy Daybell. And when you started looking at the the records on the iCloud account, was it still actively a search for JJ and Tylee? When I began, yes, it was. Um, but I have looked at this over the course of, of several weeks and months and, and certainly reviewed it as the case has gone on. So the initial review started prior to the children being found, uh, and, and that review um, continued. Even after they were recovered but not alive? Correct. Okay. And um, any idea how many hours it has taken you to go through all of these um, records? Well over 200 hours. Okay. And so um, in, in those excess of 200 hours, in, did you also, as you were reviewing it, sort of find investigative leads or concepts that merited following up? Yes. What were some of those investigative leads or concepts that merited, merited following up? First and foremost, it was the relationship between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. Um, why is that? Why, why is that relevant? Well, it was uh, apparent that they were uh, very quickly after meeting involved in an uh, illicit affair with one another and that they shared plans to um, be married and have a life together. Were there any other investigative leads or concepts that needed follow-up? Yes, as part of the plans between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow, they had obstacles that were in the way of them uh, achieving. You're not on objective. This is argumentative. Sustain. Um, when you say they had, um, understand the, the court's ruling, so you, you identified leads that followed up. Um, did you find um, information or discussion that there were barriers to their um, efforts to be together? I'm going to object as to argumentative. The question is argumentative. Judge, it's an investigative process, and if it had significance to him, the jury is entitled to hear that, especially if it factored into his creation of a summary. It's overruled. Thank you, Judge. There were several communications regarding Tylee and J.J., um, that were relevant uh, to their deaths. Okay. How so? They discussed their deaths. Okay. And what did that have to do with the concept that they had, had begun an affair or planned a future together? After the affair began, there then began to be communications regarding the deaths of Charles Vallow, Tammy Daybell, J.J., Vallow and Tylee Ryan. Okay. Any conversations about Tammy Daybell? Yes. Okay. And was, was there communication that um, law enforcement had to follow up on that suggested that those individuals were considered barriers 
to the, the, uh, by the defendant to her future with Chad Daybell. I'm going to object this to argumentative, Judge. Overruled. The exact word they used in the communications was obstacles. Okay. And just to be clear, the communications between who? Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. Okay. And they characterized J.J., Tylee, Tammy, Charles as obstacles. Correct. Okay. Your Honor, I'm going to object as this is misstates the uh, actual evidence. The evidence will be admitted shortly, Judge. I'm just laying a foundation for summary. Okay. Well, it's uh, at this point then without that being entered into yet, there's no foundation for those comments, so I'll sustain that objection. Okay. And so in um, following up and pursuing investigative leads and information within the iCloud accounts and in connection to interviews and other evidence, were there any other um, investigative leads or information that merited following up? Yes, there was financial information that was deemed to be relevant. There was information regarding the relationship between Alex Cox, Lori Vallow's brother, uh, and Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell that were relevant. And um, was there, in terms of the financial information, why would that be relevant in analyzing the iCloud account in context of this investigation? Well, uh, during the course of the investigation, one of the elements that we examined was a potential financial motive for the crimes. And so that was part of our process in, uh, in being thorough as it relates to looking at all the information that was available to us as we uh, conducted the case. And in the review of the evidence of the case, in particular the information contained in the iCloud accounts, was there um, information that suggested there was evidence of financial motive for these individuals? I'm going to object, Your Honor. That's argumentative. Overruled. Yes. Um, what evidence did you find that merited um, following up as an investigative uh, tool or investigative uh, avenue? In the iCloud specifically, there was uh, communications and direct references to uh, a large life insurance policy possessed by Charles Vallow as well as uh, Social Security payments that were attributable attributable to J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan. You also indicated that there was some investigative information sort of stemming or contributed to from Lori Vallow's iCloud account about a relationship between Alexander Cox, Chad Daybell, and Lori Vallow. Did I hear that correctly? Yes. Okay. What information or evidence did you hear that, that led to investigative pursuits? There were a number of communications between uh, Alex Cox and Lori Vallow that were deemed to be pertinent to the investigation, and it was clear that there was a uh, relationship between Alex Cox and Chad Daybell as well. Okay. And why would those things be relevant to the investigation and to what happened to J.J., Tylee, and Tammy? Those relationships were important because those individuals uh, throughout the course of the investigation, um, that's ultimately who was charged with the alleged crimes. Okay. Now, in using what is um, up on the screen, the, the iCloud account for Lori Vallow, for you know both Lori for style and Lolly time, um, you had to go through sort of each one of these screens that we saw um, for about approximately 200 hours. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So um, I, did you prepare a summary exhibit for use in explaining the findings and representing certain text um, to the jury? I did. Okay. Otherwise, we have to go line by line through the iCloud. That's correct. All right. And so in... Um, in preparing that, did you pick um, texts that were representative of investigative concepts or communications by the defendant? 
yes, I chose those pieces of uh, data. So there are text messages, there are multimedia messages, there are videos, there are emails, there are notes, uh, and those things that I deemed to be pertinent, to be directly relevant to this case. Um, I would, in terms of preparing my summary, I would cut and paste directly from the iCloud and put it into a PowerPoint presentation. So that was my method, was to cut and paste exactly what is displayed in the iCloud account into the summary exhibit. Okay. Can you just use the pointer again and show us what you would cut and paste, uh, just so that we're clear um, that you literally took from the iCloud and put it into your summary exhibit? Certainly. So, again, there's a timestamp which shows a date and time, um, the parties, and then the communication. So I would note the date and the time, the parties, and then I would cut and paste. Uh, I, I didn't cut the specific phone numbers, I just noted the parties, but I would cut and paste in its entirety each message or piece of data. Okay. So you didn't hand type it, you no. cut and paste from the original into your summary? Correct. Okay. And um, that summary was prepared in anticipation of explaining your investigative findings to the jury? As an aid, yes. Okay. And um, that summary um, was an effort to uh, sort of show the representative ideas and evidence found in the iCloud? Correct. Okay. You wanted to ask that the witness be handed States Exhibit 183, and 183A. A courtesy copy of which has been given defense counsel. Agent, did you get a chance to look at states 183 and 183A? Yes. What are they? Uh, this is 183A is a hard copy of the PowerPoint presentation that I prepared for a summary exhibit. 183 is an electronic copy of that with my initials on the thumb drive. Okay. So you prepared that thumb drive? Yes. Okay. And 183A is a physical hard copy um, for use in court or by the jury? Correct. Okay. Um, I move for the admission of States Exhibit 183 and 183A. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. We stated on the record prior to uh, or outside the presence of the jury what that, um, what that objection was, and we would just stand by that objection. All right. The court heard argument on an objection earlier this morning outside the presence of the jury. I made a ruling with no new uh, substance to the objection. The court will stand by its prior ruling and allow for the exhibits 183 and 183A to be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. And you're under making sure the court has their courtesy copy of 183A, correct? Thank you. I do. Thank you. I request permission to display State's Exhibit 183A. You can publish it. Thank you. And actually, I think what you're publishing is 183, not A. I apologize. Yes. Thanks, Judge. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. 
right. Agent, if you could look at the screen. Um, I see displayed uh, an initial uh, slide in States Exhibit 183. What are we seeing here? This is a line that I located in the contact section of Lori for Style at iCloud.com. And um, it was saved under the name of Bishop Shumway. It was created on October 28, 2018. Uh, what stands out about this particular contact is that the telephone Jack number. Jack he's now giving a narrative exa explanation. Oh, uh, sustained. Okay. So um, what is it that it stands out about the slide we're looking at? What stands out is that the phone number 208-690-9374 is the known cellular telephone number for Chad Daybell. And what was the date this contact um, is reflected in the cell phone data or the iCloud account of Lori Vallow? It was created on October 28, 2018. And, and just so that we're clear, that date had significance because why? Chad and Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow met at a Preparing a People conference in St. George, Utah on October 26th, and that conference spanned the, the 26th, 27th, and 28th of October. Okay. Is this the first known electronic evidence of contact between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow? It is. So turning to um, the next, which um, is labeled the SMS section, Lori for Style at iCloud.com, what are we seeing here? This is a text string uh, between Lori Vallow and Audrey Baratario that took place on January 23rd of 2019. Okay. If you could read to us the record, into the record, what that text string was. Yes. Line 2585. Hi, Audrey. This is Lori. I would love to talk to you sometime. Text me or call me. I'm excited to be able to talk to you about what we both know. Line 2584. Oh, hi, Lori. Guess you talked to Chad. Ha ha. Line 2580. Did he tell you I have a crazy work schedule? I might be able to talk tonight. I'll have to play it by ear, but it wouldn't until ABT 9.30 p.m. or after. The same for tomorrow. Line 2578, uh, Lori Vallow to Audrey Baratario. He did. That's okay. Just let me know when you are available. No pressure. I just think it's fun to talk to someone who knows what's really going on. Line 2576. Reply from Audrey Baratario to Lori Vallow. So what times usually work for you? I usually talk to him on my lunch breaks in Mondays or Tuesdays. Sunday afternoons, I can talk. Agent, the question, my question is, this, this communication by the defendant with Audrey Baratario, um, what, if any, significance did it have to you? The, signif the significance that it had to me is the reference to what Lori Vallow and Audrey Baratario both knew. Why is that significant? It's significant because Chad Daybell had disclosed to Audrey Baratario his plans to marry Lori Vallow. Okay. And um, did, did it also indicate anything about a, an establishment of a friendship or a relationship between Audrey and Lori? Yes. Chad had told Audrey Baratario that his wife, Tammy Daybell, was going to die and that he and Lori were to be married, but he wanted Audrey to act as a buffer between uh, he and Lori uh, during the ensuing time period until Tammy Daybell died. And does it indicate that um, Audrey Baratari was willing to engage in that friendship with Lori? Based on the text string, yes. Okay. Now, 
Now, turning to an SMS text section in the Lawyer for Style at iCloud.com from March 20th, 2019. Can you explain to us what we're seeing here? These are some texts that took place on March 20th of 2019 between Lori Vallow and Alex Cox. Could you read those into the record, please? Line 1842 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. I'm finding out some great stuff about you. I'm going to go do some ceilings. Can't wait to share all the things I learned about you. Wow, you're going to like it. It explains a lot. Line 1840, text from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. Okay, hurry up, please. Line 1837, uh, reply text from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. I'm going to check everything with my source tonight to make sure I got this all right, but it's really good. We can talk about it tomorrow, hopefully. Now, um, Agent, why did you include uh, this in your summary? During the course of the investigation, it became uh, apparent that um, Chad Daybell acted as a quasi-religious leader and that Alex Cox was involved in the alleged conspiracy as it related uh, to the deaths of the children and Tammy Daybell. And this is an instance where Lori Vallow is communicating to her brother Alex Cox regarding the things that she is learning about him. The reference to going to check with my source tonight, I believe, is a reference to Chad Daybell. Objection calls for speculation. That's overruled, but obviously you can go into that on cost. Very good. Thank you. Um, now, looking at this text, you indicated that Chad became a quasi-leader. Was there evidence to suggest why Lori Vallow would be communicating that to Alex Cox rather than just Chad? There were occasions where Lori Vallow made direct um, communications uh, regarding religious matters or religious concepts, but it was frequent and repetitive that Alex Cox, Melanie Boudreau, others would solicit Lori to check or inquire with Chad Daybell and then would uh, return answers back to those individuals. In context of the evidence from the iCloud and the other evidence in totality of the case, um, was there evidence on Lori Vallow's sort of position power with regard to those people in religious concepts? Yes. What was that position power and what evidence was there of that? Her position was um, right next to Chad Daybell. Uh, the two of them were in an elevated position and others would seek their counsel and advice as it related to alleged revelations and visions and so forth. In, in seeking that counsel or information, was there any evidence at times that Alex Cox or others would seek direct, direction or instruction from Lori Vallow? Yes. And is that reflected in some of the text in, um, that you've provided in summary? It is. Was it, is it reflected throughout both iCloud um, accounts um, and the overall account of Lori Vallow? Yes, it is. Now, turning towards an SMS text from Lori for, in Lori for Style at iCloud.com, um, can you tell us what we're looking at, um, you know, from line 1763 through 1761? This is another short uh, text string between Alex Cox and Lori Vallow that took place on March 26th of 2019. Okay. Um, and could you read those lines into the record, please? Yes. Line 1763, text from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. Correct. Charles's body is alive. 
line 1762 from Alex Cox to Lori Vallow. What did you learn? Line 1761 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. A lot. Still working on it. We'll call you later. Why was this series of the SMS um, included in your summary? These short texts uh, actually contain a lot of information regarding what was taking place in the investigation. How so? Chad Daybell had identified uh, Charles Vallow as somebody who was a dark entity whose body had been possessed by any number of spirits, uh, which were named with various names. And so this first text, when Alex Cox is uh, reaching out to Lori Vallow, he's, he's affirming that Charles Vallow's body, his physical body, is still alive and inquiring what Lori Vallow had learned about that, which she replied she had learned a lot and would contact him later. And so um, the learned a lot. What does still working on it mean in context of the iCloud account and the overall investigation? We see, or I saw, very frequent usage of that particular term. Uh, we are working uh, on things, and that is a direct reference to this um, belief that they were uh, in a, a battle uh, against zombies and dark entities and so when they would talk about working on something they were making a reference to their efforts and you know, related object. to this that. Is this is misstating the evidence that's actually been put in. I think it's beyond the scope of what's been entered so I'll sustain that. Okay. Um, when you say they said working on it, was it often Lori Vallow herself saying working on it? Yes. Okay. And in your review of the text section in the MMS and the various iCloud accounts reflecting Lori Vallow's um, statements or state of mind, um, did you see evidence that her brother believed what she was saying? Frequently. Okay. Did you see evidence reflected um, that would show that um, Alex Cox was seeking input or direction from his sister with regard to the various potential bad spirits or people's physical body? Yes. Turning to the SMS section of lollytime at iCloud.com, um, and I see a group of texts um, from July 9th of 2019. Is that is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And I noticed that each of these slides have appeared chronological. And I, forgive me if I didn't ask. In preparing your summary, how did you put the various text into your summary? I did that chronologically. So during in in the summary, you'll see. We may move back and forth between Lori for Style at iCloud.com and Lolly Time at iCloud.com. Uh, for the most part, it's Lori for Style in the beginning and the ending of this summary exhibit, and and most of the middle of it is taken from Lolly Time at iCloud.com. But I placed all of the data chronologically. Why? I think that that paints the most accurate picture of what was taking place as it relates to the communications. If you separate them out into various sections, then it becomes very fragmented. And I believe that chronologically, I mean, it, these events took place chronologically, so it made sense to arrange the exhibit chronologically. Okay. And so um, we're seeing a text communication um, July 9th, 2019. Uh, between Lori Vallow and Melanie Butchero. Is that correct? Yes. Could you read those into the record, please? Yes. Line 3135 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. They have an elaborate plan. I'll call you soon. Line 3134 from Melanie Boudreau to Lori Vallow. I could take all the babies with and drive and take our stuff. 
line 3133 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. You can't go at all. We both need to stay here to defend ourselves. Line 3132 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. It's coming to a head. This week will change everything. Okay. Why did you include that particular series of text um, from Lori Vallow in your summary? Yeah, the only way you can answer that is through hearsay evidence. I'll sustain that objection. I, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I, I, I guess I don't understand the objection. Your Honor, would the court like me to clarify? Like may, may we approach sidebar? Because like I, I, really, I really don't understand. Well, I'd like to have the question reread, please. Okay. All right, upon rehearing the question, I misheard that. I'll overrule that objection. Thank Apologies. you. Thank you. Do, did you hear the question? Do I have it repeated? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, the timeline in this case is important. So this text string took place in the evening of July 9th, 2019, which is approximately 36 hours uh, before uh, Charles Vallow was killed. These texts are a reference uh, to um, events surrounding that. Okay. And again, Judge, I'm going to object just for the record that the only way he could have gotten that information was specifically to Melanie Boudreau is through hearsay evidence from Melanie Boudreau. All right. Well, he's testified it's through information obtained through these iCloud accounts. So for that, I'll, and because they've been admitted, I'll overrule the objection. Thank you. All right. And so the timing of this uh, communication by Louis Vallow was significant to you in relation to the death of Charles Vallow? Correct. Okay. And in the text, it was a text from Louis Vallow. In her own words, it's coming to a head. This week will change everything. Yes. Okay. <laughs> And when, you, when um, in context of the investigation and the overall um, review of the iCloud, what does it's coming to a head mean um, to you? It's a reference to the marriage between uh, Charles Vallow and Lori Vallow. Uh, their marriage from, from the communications and the totality of the investigation had deteriorated uh, substantially and I'll, I'll object to speculation that, that she's calling for him to speculate as to what these texts mean I'll sustain that okay. and ask to strike that from the record all right the final part of that answer will be stricken from the record based on the objection the jury's instructed not to please consider that particular response okay. so um, in, in your review of the evidence in your review of the iCloud did you learn from the defendant's own words that her marriage to Charles Vallow was deteriorated? Yes. Okay. In fact, I believe you early talked about that she characterized Charles Vallow as an obstacle. Is that correct? That's argumentative, Judge. Overruled. It was actually Chad Daybell who used the phrase obstacles relating uh, or uh, connect in in connection with um, these individuals. Okay, and so it's coming to a head. Um, that statement from the defendant um, was there evidence within the iCloud uh, that you reviewed the defendant's own words that reflected whether or not she wanted Charles Vallow out of her life as her husband. Yes. Let's turn to some additional a text from the early time on July 9th, 2019, reflected in the next slide. Could you please um, look at lines 3120 and 3072? Do you see those? I do. Could you read those into the record, please? Yes. Line 3120 from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox. Getting sleepy, so I'm gone 
to need you to stay close to me the next couple days. Mel, too. She can't go to Utah. They are planking some kind of intervention, but want Mel out of the way so I'm left alone. I need to come get the stuff at your house tomorrow and secure it. Lots to do. Thank you for standing by me. It's all coming to a head this week. I will be like Nephi, I am told, and so will you. Line 3072, text from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. Al is here. Charles says he will come over in the morning. Why did you include this particular, um, these particular texts from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox and Melanie Boudreau in your summary? Your Honor, I'll object that these text things out of context. He specifically stated that he is going in uh, line by line, and it looks like there's almost uh, almost a hundred uh, lines between these two texts. Um, I'll overrule the objection, and I think it's appropriate for cross examination. Okay. Very good, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. The question was, um, why did you include these particular? Um, text communications from Lori Vallow to Alex Cox and Melanie Boudreau in your summary. During the course of the investigation, we found out that Adam Cox, another brother of Lori Vallow, had flown in uh, in conjunction with Charles Vallow to try to approach Lori regarding the things that were taking place. Um, and, and so that's why I included these communications. Okay. And um, turning to line 3120, I will be like Nephi, I am told, and so will you. Um, in your review of the evidence and your research on the items of relevance in the iCloud account, what is Nephi? Nephi is the name of an ancient prophet whose life is um, documented or chronicled in a book of scripture called the Book of Mormon. And so um, he is one of the, that, that book of scripture spans from 600 BC to roughly 400 AD, and Nephi is one of the first uh, prophets that is. Um, documented in that particular book. Okay. And um, the phrase, I will be like Nephi, um, other than a, an ancient prophet, is was there significance to the investigation that merited review in the use of the word Nephi as applied to Lori Vallow and Alex Cox? Objection. Calls for speculation. She, he's already indicated that Nephi is found throughout the Book of Mormon, which is... which. Is hundreds of pages long. I'll sustain the objection. Thank you. Um, in terms of Lori's use and her own words identifying herself as Nephi, what were the situations involving Nephi that were relevant to the investigations? Objection calls for speculation. I think there need to be some additional foundation. Uh, you're going to go into that term and what it means in the context of these communications. Okay. So in terms of uh, foundation, are you aware of um, historical um, attributes or um, story significance to the prophet Nephi? I am. Okay. Um, what were the historic accounts related to the prophet Nephi? Okay, objection vague. There are hundreds of stories about Nephi. That's overruled. Thank you. The witness knows the witness can answer. The primary one relates to an incident where Nephi was commanded by God to slay an individual named Laban. Your Honor, I'm going to object as this is speculative. Overruled. I'm sorry, you can keep going. You said it was about Nephi was commanded to slay Laban. Yes. And um, what was the rest of that particular historic accounting of the prophet Nephi? Simply put, Laban was in possession of records that Nephi and his family wanted to possess before they left Jerusalem, and Nephi was commanded by God to slay Laban to obtain those records. Okay. And so Laban kill it. Was Laban considered a, a, a good guy or a bad guy? Bad guy. Okay. Again, Your Honor, based on his response to the question, I believe it's irrelevant, and it it. it specifically doesn't have anything to do 
with uh, the crime that's charged here, and it doesn't have it doesn't even correlate. Well, there's a reference to the term in the text, and I'll allow a little more on this, but it's getting outside the scope of I think what's relevant. Pretty quick here, Ms. Smith. The defendant herself likened herself to Nephi, correct? Yes. And the defendant likened, likened Alex Cox to Nephi, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and in, if I understand correctly, um, Nephi was commanded to kill Laban. That's correct. I'm going to object as to vague. Nephi was commanded to do lots of things. Overruled. Um, and so... And the date that the defendant likens herself to Nephi um, was July 9th, 2019? Yes. She also told Alex he was like Nephi, correct? Yes. Okay. And in the text communication from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau, um, did Lori Vallow indicate on July 10th, 2019, that Alex Cox was with her. Yes. Okay. Now, defense counsel pointed out, and we're going to chat about this in a minute, I noticed that there's a line number and a date, and then it appears to have a different line number and a different date in your summary. Why didn't you include every text between those two? If I included every text between the two accounts, we would be at well over 8,000 text messages. And so um, I chose those texts that I felt were in context and were relevant. Um, but oftentimes there would be three or four people texting with Lori Vallow at the same time, and some of those texts in between have no relevance whatsoever to this case. Other texts were very redundant. Um, we see the same type of communication over and over and over again. Uh, and so I chose those text messages that I believed were relevant to this case and was cautious not to um, prepare this summary exhibit where I'm taking things out of context. Okay. And um, if you included every text, it really wouldn't be a summary, would it? No, it wouldn't. Okay. Now, um, turning towards some chats that were in Lori for style, um, can you tell us what we're seeing next on slide seven? Yes, this is so a, a chat in the uh, iCloud account um, generally was amongst multiple individuals, and the chat would contain numerous or could contain numerous texts. Um, this is a uh, chat between Lori Vallow, Cole Vallow, and Zach Vallow. Uh, Cole Vallow and Zach Vallow are Charles Vallow's sons. Okay. And this is communication from Lori Vallow in that chat? Correct. Okay. Could you please read into the records the communications that Lori Vallow had and um, to whom? Certainly. So uh, July 12, 2019, Hi, boys. I have very sad news. Your dad passed away yesterday. I'm working on making arrangements, and I'll keep you informed with what's going on. I'm still not sure how to handle things. Just want you to know that I love you, and so did your dad. 3.41 p.m. on the same date. Lori, what happened? 3.43 p.m. We are still waiting for the ME report. I'll let you know more when I can. 5.54 p.m. Lori, what the fuck happened? You can't just tell us out dad died and disappeared. You're not too busy to just let us know he died and disappear. Okay. Why did you include this particular series of um, chats in your summary? For timeline purposes, this series of communications took place the day following Charles Vallow's death, and um, it is uh, indicative of the communication from Lori Vallow to Charles Vallow's sons regarding their father's death, but excludes the manner of death. Now, 
Um, well, then, I, did you, let's move ahead. Um, in terms of in within a few hours of then on July 13th, um, could you tell us what we're seeing in the SMS section of Lally Time uh, at iCloud.com? Yes. This is a, a series of texts uh, between Chad Daybell, Lori Vallow, and ultimately Melanie Boudreau, subsequent to Charles Vallow's death, um, Brandon Boudreau, Melanie Boudreau's husband, brought an individual to the house to talk with Melanie, and this series of texts re is in regards to that person. Okay. And um, Lori Vallow was a part of this text communication, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and it was a text communication between Lori and Chad and included Melanie Boudreau. Correct. Okay. Could you please read those in the record? Yes. Line 3002 from Chad Bay Daybell to Lori Vallow. I will check all bloomer and husband. Line 3001 from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell. Good idea. Line 3000 from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Ali Bloomer is 4.1 dark. Her cop husband is 3 dark. I suppose Brandon doesn't know yet about the discovered Charles's texts. Line 2996 from Lori Vallow to Melanie Boudreau. Ali Bloomer's husband, 3, and then a dark emoji. And so um, these texts, you know, involving Chad, Lori, and then ultimately Melanie Boudreau were between 9.30 p.m. and around 10.05 p.m. on the 13th, correct? Yes. Okay. And why did you include these texts between that time in your summary? I included them because they demonstrate that um, anyone who tried to intercede was identified as dark. I don't understand how... No, I don't want to object. That's speculative, and we're now getting into the weeds. I'll sustain that, and we should have the answer stricken, I presume. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes. All right. The uh, previous answer will be stricken, not to be considered by the jurors. Okay. So um, did you have, an, in context of the iCloud, did it reflect who Allie Bloomer was? Allie Bloomer was a friend of Melanie Boudreau. Okay. And oh, excuse Boom. me, Brandon Boudreau. Okay. And um, and did you learn whether or not Allie Bloomer had approached Melanie Boudreau about her um, situation with Lori Vallow? It was Brandon Objection Boudreau. Objection hearsay, Judge. Overruled. <laughs> it was Brandon Boudreau who brought Allie Bloomer and her husband, who was a police officer, over to the house to talk to Melanie Boudreau. Okay. And then this text communication reflects reaching out by Lori Vallow and Chad Vallow um, and ultimately to Lori, to Melanie Boudreau about the sort of status of Allie Bloomer and her husband. Correct. Those two individuals visited the Boudreau residence and they were identified as dark. Now, sticking within this team, time, same time frame, within um, you know a day, day and a half of Charles Vallow's text, there were other texts or SMS that you considered relevant. Yes. Can you tell us what we're seeing as reflected in line twenty nine sixty seven from July thirteenth? Yes, this is a text between Chad Daybell uh, and or a text from Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow. Um, regarding plans for the two of them to get together. Can you please read that? Yes. Line 2967. Concerning the two weeks, BYU-Idaho's graduation is July 23rd. Adam is getting his bachelor's, and Leah and Joe are getting their associates. They are all walking in the same commencement ceremony. I feel she will be gone by then but I will still have that hoopla to deal with because a lot of my and Adam's family are coming and will stay for July 24th. So I believe that's why the Lord hinted I might not get to be with you until that is over. 
please ask about that.